Thanks. Uh, so I, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, see this nice uh, new center. And um, so uh, uh, today I want to tell you about uh, some work that I've uh, done in collaboration with uh, Smir Gazit. Uh, Wait, this, this button? Oh. Okay, yeah, with uh, Snir Gazid, who was a, a student at Technion and who's now um, a postdoc in Berkeley. Uh, Eloise Non, uh, who was a postdoc in the group. Uh, Ath Auerbach and Dana Robas. Now, what I'll tell you about is a story surrounding helium. And as you know, helium is, um, a, is one of the lightest elements, and it also uh, has a, a filled uh, outer shell, which uh, means that it only interacts very weakly through uh, Van der Waals uh, interactions. Uh, which makes it uh, one of the, you know, the, basically the most boring uh, material from a point of view of chemistry, but actually that's, that's precisely what make this, makes it interesting uh, physics-wise. So uh, if you look at the phase diagram of helium-4, uh, bosonic helium, um, this is pressure versus temperature, and you see that if you're at ambient pressure, even if you cool down to zero Kelvin, um, a helium does not solidify. So if you want to uh, form a solid, you have to uh, apply a, a external pressure so, and when you do that, most of the time you land in this uh, hexagonal closed packed phase. But if you tune the uh, pressure and temperature just right, you land in this uh, small sliver, uh, which is uh, body center cubic. Uh, and so what I'm gonna be telling you about is all about this uh, small phase, uh, body center cubic phase of helium. So now body center cubic is uh, a, a monatomic uh, barbe lattice, and so from the usual uh, arguments of uh, phonons, you would expect it to have only uh, acoustic phonons. So, um, a few years ago, well, uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, um, uh, uh, people started looking at this, and uh, they basically put the helium in, uh, uh, you know, in a cell and made a single crystal. And uh, here, what I'm showing you is an elastic intro scattering, energy versus momentum. And uh, you can ignore the lines, those are uh, comparisons with, uh, with theory. Uh, the, you know, the points show you these three nice uh, acoustic uh, modes, uh, but I'm not showing you all of the data. So here's uh, something unexpected. You also get this extra mode, which is uh, something that looks like an optical mode. Um, and uh, uh, here I'm showing you what the uh, neutron scattering actually looks like, uh, you know, counts as a function of energy. So here you see uh, on the same plot the longitudinal uh, phonon uh, together with this uh, new excitation. Um, and if you want to isolate this excitation, you can just sit at the Bragg uh, vector, because at the Bragg vector you, you don't get any acoustic phonons, and then you see this, this new mode, and you see that even its width uh, is, is, is comparable to the width of the, of the acoustic phonons. So it's, it's a very clear mode uh, seen in the experiment. Um, so, now, uh, you can also, in, in, you know, when you do neutron scattering, you can control the incoming and outgoing uh, uh, momenta of the, of the neutrons, and this gives you uh, control over the momentum transfer and also the polarization of the, of the phonons. And so this is the data that I showed you earlier, but um, you can also, for example, look at the, so that was in the 110 direction. Here, if you look at the uh, 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 transverse 100 configuration, you see that there is this optical mode which seems to be uh, dispersionless. And uh, if you look here now in the longitudinal 100 direction, you even see two different optical modes, one that's dispersionless and one that's uh, dispersing. And so this is really uh, something that's, um, you know, sort of, that's, that's sort of the, the question, you know, what are these modes um, that you, you naively do not expect? Um, so I want to take a, a step back uh, to just remind you about you know, why we come to the conclusion that there should be only acoustic phonons in, 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 uh, in, in, in monatomic lattices, or bay lattices. And so basically the way that we usually think about phonons is this. We, we think about you know, some perfect uh, crystal uh, with, whose equilibrium positions are denoted by capital R. But if you want to look, if you want to consider the actual position of an atom in a given uh, instant in time, it's, uh, it's, it's shifted from this equilibrium position by some, um, a, a, by some displacement. And, and typically what we assume is that this displacement U um, is, is very small, it's root mean squared, 
uh, or the displacement is very small relative to the um, interatomic separation delta r. And so when, that's, when that happens, you can basically uh, Taylor expand the uh, interaction energy to second order in the displacement, you get something like this. And then this is something that you can uh, basically uh, diagonalize by uh, going to the Fourier uh, a, a space. And then, um, and then basically you get some three by three matrix that you diagonalize and you get your three acoustic columns. Okay. And now usually um, there's also corrections, you know, because this is just a Taylor expansion. There are anharmonic corrections to the harmonic theory, which go like u to the cube, the u to the fourth, etc. cetera. Um, but there is uh, the Lindemann criterion, which is, uh, it's a rule of thumb, it's, uh, which says that uh, typically when the root mean square displacement between atoms reaches 10% uh, of the uh, interatomic separation, the crystal melts. Um, and so this Lindemann criterion actually gives a um, justification for why we always have to stay with the small displacements because, you know, whenever this is true, then, you, then these anharmonic terms are um, sort of guaranteed to be small relative to the harmonic part. So, so I want to show you that helium is different from uh, typical uh, crystals. And so, uh, so the first indication is that if you take helium and just look at, um, you know, what's the density in equilibrium for, you know, what's the interatomic uh, separation between atoms, um, you'll see that it's actually larger than what, you know, it's basically, basically atoms are pushed apart because of their kinetic energy. Um, and so, because it's so light, um, and so what ends up happening is that any given atom, if you, if you consider where it sits relative to the position, to the potential created by its neighbors, it actually sits at the local maximum of that potential. Okay, this is very unusual. In, in classical solids, an atom would, would have to sit always at the minimum of the potential of its neighbors. And that's, for example, so here you see argon, this blue point versus helium, the red. Okay. Uh, another indication is, uh, I already mentioned the Lindemann, Lindemann parameter. So here uh, I'm showing you the Lindemann parameter for uh, different novel gases in solid, you know, when they're solidified, you know, they're, uh, uh, well, in, in uh, uh, so, so, so here, for example, this is uh, BCC helium uh, four, and you see that the Lindemann parameter is, is almost thirty percent. Okay, so this is well, uh, you know, beyond the ten percent that uh, that typically uh, indicates melting in in, in in classical solids. And um, another indication that uh, harmonic, you know, that uh, that anharmonic terms are very important is that the harmonic theory just does not give the correct. Uh, acoustic phonon velocities. You have to do some type of self-consistent um, approach, including all the, uh, all the uh, anharmonicities, and that's not even very successful. Okay. So, and finally, um, here what I'm showing you is is some uh, plot of uh, of helium of a 2D plane of helium, um, and this is this is from Monte Carlo, uh, quantum Monte Carlo, where you know this this what you see here is is points that are meandering. What you see is basically the trajectory of a given atom in imaginary time in the quantum Monte Carlo. And um, what you see is that these, you know, so instead of getting, you know, this very nice classical lattice of points, um, you know, the points are really spread out a lot. This is consistent with this Lindemann parameter that I told you of 30%. And what's more, if, if I were to show you a similar plot of, 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 of superfluid helium, it, it would actually look almost the same locally I mean, here, of course, you can tell that it's a solid because you, you can look at it globally and see that there is, you know, your eye can pick out that there's, that there's long range order. But if you look at the long, uh, local correlations, it looks almost the same as in superfluid uh, helium. So this is a very, very um, a unusual solid. And so, um, okay. So, so the point is, I guess, that, uh, you know, this gives us some motivation because it says, well, okay, if, if these anharmonic terms are large, then perhaps, you know, this, you know, one could get extra modes because when you have restoring forces that are nonlinear, then in principle, this type of uh, nonlinear equations can give you more solutions than uh, the numbers of degrees of freedom, okay, because the equations are non. But this doesn't really give us a way to actually build a, a, an understanding, some theory for, for what's going on. So, um, so really, that's what I would like to, to present, some, 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 some possible way to explain it. So basically, the point of view that I want to take is I, I want to contrast an ideal uh, crystal. So an ideal crystal here, I'm showing you basically a train of, of delta functions in position. 
which basically is an idealized crystal. And this is what it, this would look like if you Fourier transform. It would give you a train of uh, Bragg peaks that uh, do not decay uh, with momentum. Uh, on the other hand, for something that looks like helium, so this is basically the uh, density profile that looks uh, like uh, the one of helium, uh, the Bragg peaks decay quite quickly. And you basically have these two principal Bragg peaks. OK, I'm only just showing you the 1D problem. Uh, in higher dimensions, there's more. In 3D, there's more. But, uh, but the, the, the question, I guess, would be um, if we, so this sort of motivates us to focus on the dynamics of these principal uh, Bragg vectors. And a different way of saying this is, you know, should we think about helium, uh, solid helium-4 more as a charge density wave than as a classical solid? And when I say charge density wave, I do not mean charge density wave literally. I, you know, I do not mean that actually the charges that the electrons in the, in the helium are doing anything. I'm just saying I should really maybe call it an atomic density wave. Basically, what, I'm, what I mean is that maybe we should think about this density profile more as a you know, atomic density wave than as a classical solid. And, so, and the reason that, I, that this could be useful is that when you have a charge density wave, there are two types of, um, of uh, uh, collective modes. Uh, there's phasons, which correspond to shifting the charge density wave left and right. And these are gapless, so these are correspond to the acoustic modes. But there are also amplitude fluctuations of the charge density wave, and these are gapped. And so, um, and so basically here, there's a natural way to think about getting uh, a gap. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the amplitude is the Higgs mode of the of the charge density wave. Yeah. So it's exactly the same. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. and so, um, and so. Okay. So, but what I showed you was like a one D charge density wave. So I want to walk you through what uh, you know. How does how can one describe three D solids as as charge density waves? So, um, so basically. Um, a, so the idea is, you know, the order parameter is, is density uh, relative to the average density. Um, and so if we assume that the order parameter is, is small, uh, and this, this, for example, is, is justified if you're close to a first order crystallization transition that's weak, uh, that's weak enough, um, then, uh, then basically we can, this gives us some hierarchy where, um, the, where the cubic term in the free energy, I'm writing now against Orlando free energy, the, the, the quadratic term is larger than the cubic term, which is larger than the quartic term. And this also allows us to um, cut off higher order terms uh, and ignore them. And so if we write this in, in Fourier space, this is what the free energy would look like. And here I just haven't told you what is this, this guy. This is a static susceptibility, which uh, basically looks like this. Uh, it has a minimum at uh, the wave vector of the solidification. And sort of the idea is that as you, as, you, as you go through the liquid to solid transition, you know, you basically change, you basically move this potential down, and at some point, this minima cross zero, and the system solidifies. Actually, I'm showing this as two points, but this is really uh, a sphere in 3D. Um, and so, uh, so to find out what's the uh, configuration that minimizes the Ginsburg-Landau free energy, uh, as I said, we have this hierarchy, so we, 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 we start by minimizing the quadratic term, then the cubic term, and so on. So the quadratic term, what it wants to do is it wants to condense on points on this uh, sphere of uh, a momentum uh, G. Um, but this does not tell you exactly which configuration you would like to favor. So for that, you have to now go um, to the next term. And, um, and here, what you see is that there is this uh, momentum-conserving delta function which um, what it does is that every time that you have three momenta on this sphere that add up to zero, um, you get a contribution from the cubic term that lowers your free energy. And so what you would like to do is basically you would like to find some configuration that maximizes the number of triangles whose mom total momentum, uh, momentum uh, adds up to zero. And um, if you compare all of the, um, a, a, all, all of the Bravais lattices, it turns out that PCC is the one that, uh, that has the most triangles. Okay? Basically, it's, it's, it's dual lattice, which is FCC, is the one that has the most triangles. So, 
Um, so basically, this is some argument for why if you have a weekly first order transition, it should always be into a BCC phase, which is uh, was that's the name of this article. Should all other articles be BCC by Alexander McTagg, which is a great article that I um, recommend reading. But anyways, um, so this is just looking at the statics, okay, um, of of what minimizes the free energy. But um, but we what we want to know is the dynamics. So we want to know what are the collective modes, and so we need to supplement this uh, free energy with some a dynamical term. Um, and so uh, this is the lowest order term that's consistent with the symmetries of the problem. And uh, and so then what we want to do is we want to take our mean field solution, which is this row uh, with a bar now, and, and we want to add now a fluctuating uh, term, a small uh, fluctuating term, and we want to basically write down the linearized uh, Euler Lagrange equations and, and solve them for the normal modes. Okay. So now, in this case, we this, so this is, so we have six pairs of uh, of 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 of, uh, of 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 rack vectors. So this gives us uh, 12 modes. Okay. So this is uh, actually the, the the result of a calculation. Um, here I'm showing you one part of the, the, this uh, one one zero direction, um, and here I'm showing you what the modes look like in another direction. You, you'll see here that there is this uh, non-dispersing mode that appears uh, in, the, in the one zero zero direction. And uh, you'll also see that there are certain uh, degeneracies uh, that has, as Q goes to zero. So it'd be nice to understand what are these degeneracies and, 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 and why do we get these flat modes. So first of all, um, to understand the degeneracies, uh, Basically, what you know, what the, the thing to do is just to realize that these modes should uh, organize into uh, irreducible re uh, re representations of the uh, cubic uh, a, 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 a point group, and so, um, so here I'm just showing you. I mean, this is not going to tell you too much. Uh, the, the, this, each one of these uh, figures is just meant to represent one of the solutions. Um, but uh, what, what's more helpful is actually to, to, uh, to visualize the different modes. So here, so actually, before I go back, so basically these three modes are the acoustic modes that basically are sort of like PX, PY, and PC uh, symmetry. And the other ones uh, so, so, uh, uh, are, are uh, uh, gap modes. So first, um, so I'll show you this breather, which is the S wave mode. So what I'm showing you here is, is a cut of the uh, density, or, sorry, a cut of the uh, a two D cut of, uh, of 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 of, of, a, of the solid, and what I'm plotting is the the density corresponding to this uh, this 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 mode. And so what you see is that here the the uh, within each unit cell. So this is a Q equals zero mode, a zero momentum mode, or zero relative momentum mode. And what you see is that the density is just, uh, you know, becoming sharper and less sharp as, as you, you know, as part of these uh, oscillations. So this is sort of the most naive um, analog to this one-dimensional one amplitude that I showed you earlier. Um, but there's other possibilities. So, for example, if you look at the quadrupolar uh, emotes, they look like this. Basically, like what the density is doing is it's, it's doing some type of fluctuations like that. Okay, it's becoming you know you can I hope you can sort of see it there that um, the the density within each unit cell is undergoing this type of oscillations. So so which uh, uh, and well and the other thing is that uh, this mode is the one that doesn't disperse uh, in the direction in the so the moment if for the momentum perpendicular to this uh, to this uh, motion it does not disperse. Uh, and it's 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 not hard to show that. Um, so that's some symmetry uh, reason. And so, um, so now of all of these gap modes, which one is the lowest? So this is the one thing that does depend a bit on the choice of parameters. So you know we have an, a phenomenological uh, the theory. We do not know the parameters, but uh, basically there's only two two options. It's either the quadrupolar mode or the the breather. And most of the time, the quadrupolar mode is lower energy. But if you tune your parameters a bit, then you get that the breather is the lowest energy mode of the gap modes. Um, so um, now, if we want to compare with uh, neutron scattering, then uh, uh, what we need, what we do is we uh, 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 promote this Ginsburg-Landau action to some quantum 
uh, theory, and then, so basically we quantize this, and then we uh, we solve uh, for a, for this uh, dynamical structure factor. And so this is this is the result. Uh, this M is some uh, matrix element in the in, involved in the diagonalization of the uh, Ginsburg-Landau equations uh, of the Euler-Lagrange equations. But um, what's 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 uh, important is to know that these uh, these modes satisfy. Uh, that, that the total spectral weight satisfies uh, the sum rule. And this is important because, um, you know, you, you, you could uh, maybe um, complain that, you know, we've basically added all these modes to the theory, and, and so we've, we've added spurious degrees of freedom by hand. But that's not the case, because we, no matter what we do, we're satisfying the sum rule. And so what's happening is basically that we that 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 you know we have our three acoustic modes and we're creating extra modes that are optical, but um, but but we're still satisfying the sum rule, which means that we're just transferring some of the spectral weight from the um, acoustic modes to the optical modes. Okay, and um, in particular, as the, as the, as the model becomes more and more classical, basically what happens is that these optical modes become more energetic, and also the spectral weight goes down in such a way that there's a smooth way by which one can interpolate between uh, this picture and the, uh, you know, what you know about classical uh, crystals. You know, that's sort of how these modes disappear smoothly. So I just want to go back and, uh, and, and compare with, uh, with experiments. So, um, of course, you, can, you shouldn't take too literally the energy scales and everything else because, you know, the energy scales in particular because uh, we have some parameters uh, that, that are completely, uh, that we do not really know. Uh, but um, but uh, basically, uh, still, the only, as I said, the only, quali you know, important qualitative uh, feature that, 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 that matters in our model is whether the lowest mode is, is the, breather or the quadrupolar mode. And, um, and regardless, so, so here you see that uh, uh, basically you, when you compare this, here you see this weakly dispersing uh, optical mode, and here you, you get the uh, non-dispersing uh, transverse mode. So I think that we are capturing something uh, with this, with this uh, very simple model. Okay. So, so. Um, so finally, um, I, I want to spend the last few minutes just talking about uh, a, a complementary thing approach that we followed. So, um, so everything I showed you up to now is is, is um, um, phenomenological. So, but we also did uh, some ab initio calculations. So, what they consisted of was basically the uh, interatomic potential for helium is very well characterized. It's this as this potential. Which uh, is, is looks sort of like uh, you know it's a, an improvement on on, on Van der Waals, and so what what we did is we took 2,000 helium atoms and put them on a box interacting with this uh, this potential, and we choose the density and the temperature that match to the experimental values for VCC for the VCC phase, and uh, and we simulated them. Well, who did this was uh, uh, Smir Gazit. Uh, uh, he simulated these. Uh, uh, using continuous space path integral Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo, and so uh, so this is what I showed you earlier, uh, um, and so uh, and then what what he did was um, he computed the uh, structure factor. Now here uh, there's a big you know there's a caveat in this calculation, which is that when you compute um, dynamical quantities using uh, Monte Carlo, you are forced to do uh, analytical uh, analytic continuation because Monte Carlo is always on in, in, in Euclidean time, not in not in, uh, uh, in, in, re in in real time, and so you have to do an analytic continuation, and uh, and this is a, a procedure that's not very well controlled. However, it's it's fairly reliable to get at least the energy uh, scales of the lowest uh, modes in the, in the theory. So I'll talk about that a bit more in a second, but um, but here I'm showing you the the simulations for along the one one zero direction. So the blue the blue dots are uh, the experiment, the red dots are the uh, the numerics. So you see that uh, this acoustic mode is very nicely captured 
uh, by the by the numerics. And then, but what you also notice is that when you get to the BRAC back, the first BRAC peak, um, the numerics actually still give a finite energy um, excitation. So we do seem to get this, and this is what the spectral function looks like. So we do seem to be able to get these uh, optical modes, one of the optical modes uh, in, in, from the numerics, uh, which is, uh, 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 but the only thing, the only thing that you'll notice is that the energy, well, the, uh, the energy of the of the experimental mode is actually at one MeV, so this is about half of that. And so we do not really understand what's the source of this disagreement. Um, um, but uh, and so we do not know if this is something that that comes from the difficulty with the analytic continuation, or the alternative uh, explanation would be that this mode really is there. Um, but if, if there were a mode that half an MeV, it would be extremely hard to see it in uh, a neutron scattering because neutron scattering in, at a Bragg, Bragg vector, um, you always throw out a very low frequency data because uh, you get contamination from the elastic uh, signal from the from the uh, Bragg scattering, elastic Bragg scattering. So, uh, so we spoke to the experimentalists that did these measurements, and they, they said that they, they indeed threw out, threw, threw out everything that was below about 0.7 MeV. So, so that's a possibility. Uh, but uh, um, okay, well, so this is uh, basically my summary. Uh, I tried to convince you that uh, that uh, in helium is, is special, and it, you know, the harmonic theory fails there. Um, and I tried to give um, an alternative explanation, which was for this, for, for this, uh, well, an explanation for these optical modes. And what's uh, what's nice about this, I think, is that it's it's basically um, it's actually a, a linear theory because we're just linearizing the uh, uh, Ginzburg-Landau uh, the the other Lagrange equations. So, so it's a linear theory, but just using different degrees of freedom. So this is sort of saying if you choose the right degrees of freedom. You can describe this uh, using some uh, uh, linear theory, uh, and I show you that, it, that this mode can be seen in uh, Monte Carlo, and we do predict that you know there was nothing too special about helium here, other than the, other than the fact that there's this very large uh, fluctuations, and so and so um, so we do expect that such modes should be present in other um, in, in, uh, solids that are more like charge that are more charge density wave like than 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 than, than classical crystals, and so uh, I just want to show you a photo of uh, my collaborators and. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for questions. If you approach the phase boundary, mm -hmm. is it correct that as your atomic density wave, the condensate becomes smaller and smaller, your, uh, the energy of the amplitude mode also goes, uh, becomes smaller? And is this seen in experiment? Well, what happens is that, um, um, that the, you know, ultimately the transition is a first order transition. So, so so all of this works if it's a weakly first order transition, but it's not, it's not uh, clear that, um, that there's a lot of room to play. Also the phase is very narrow, you know, it's a very small phase. I, nobody, I mean, people just look, uh, you know, all of the experiments are done at one particular density and uh, so, so, you know, but there's not a lot of room to play with uh, in terms of, uh, but, but that would be an, exp there should be some dependence like that, but I don't know if there will be a lot of, uh, you know, room to see a lot of change. Um, so these large zero-point fluctuations were once thought to be responsible for super solid, you know, some super fluid-like behaviors in these solid systems. So have you looked for some signatures of super fluidity in these, in these systems you're studying? Yeah, so um, I think that probably the, probably the, uh, the role of the, you know, the role of the, statistics, you know, that these are bosons is probably not too important. The reason I, I, I think that is that we looked at, 
in the Monte Carlo, we looked at the, um, the fraction of paths that exchange. And, um, and the number was, was about, um, it was less than 1%. Uh, and so, um, so, there are, so, the, so there is some role to the, to, 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 to the statistics, but you know, it's, 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 a very, it's a relatively small, you know, it doesn't play a very dominant role in the dynamics. We're actually now doing some uh, simulations where we actually forbid the exchanges altogether just to see if, if the optical modes also appear in the Monte Carlo, you know, by lo looking at uh, uh, what are called Boltzmannons, I guess, or, you know, where you, and, but, but we, we don't have yet results for that. Uh -huh. no, I, mean, I mean, even short, uh, short range exchanges. So this is just following up on that question about statistics. So uh, do you think the statistics will become important once you start changing the density and you have a transition out, out of this, uh, this solid phase? For instance, you know, if these were fermions, then you would eventually, as you increase the density, you would get a Fermi liquid, whereas if these are bosons, I guess if you decrease the density, you will get a, um, a superfluid. So, so is that where the statistics will finally become important? Close yeah, I to the, the, right. I think that at the transition, it's, it's, it's absolutely important. And I do think that, the, so, you know, the, the so I'll, I'll contradict my previous answer. And I'll say in which sense I think that the, that the, that the, that the superfluidity must at some level be important somewhere, yeah. which is that the VCC phase is only stabilized close to the superfluid to normal liquid transition. So that would be an indication that somehow superfluid fluctuations play some role in the, in, you know, at least in the stabilization of this. I see. Phase. I see. So that's why, that's why we started looking at the statistics, exchange statistics to see. But as I said, we, we, we okay. But, but I think that the only, th the only thing to really settle this is to really forbid this, the, the exchanges altogether and see if still we get these optical modes. Yeah. That will be like a, a sure. Yeah. And just one other question. So the, so the exact form of the interaction is important at the level of telling you whether the S mode has lower energy or the D mode. I mean, that's really the that's, only that's really place. It. That's really it. So do you know whether these Higgs modes coupled to Raman uh, in the same way? Because that's another probe you could have than for optical modes. That right, right. Would be um, very different and no, easier a, to do. Right. So that's a good question. Um, uh, we haven't done the calculation, but uh, but you know this is something that, for example, I mean one of our predictions is that uh, that the same thing should be true in helium three. Even the modes should be even lower in energy because the equations are even bigger. And helium-3, you know, as you know, it absorbs uh, neutrons. It just turns, you know, a neutron that hits a helium-3 atom turns into helium-4 atom. So, so basically, th th there's no neutron. It's impossible to do neutron measurements, but maybe Raman can be done and see. Yeah, but we haven't actually done the calculation. So the interaction is not strictly local, right? So could you then have a Higgs mechanism, and can you have a small gap of the... The acoustic modes. Oh, but here it is. It is short range, right? It's uh, it's 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 Van der Waals, so, so so there shouldn't be a Higgs mechanism. I think. I think that for that you really need uh, true long range. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, well, there are no more questions. Uh, I think we can close the session. And